Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's wonderful to, to see you on screen. Thank you for uh, being with us this afternoon. I'm Mark Rusa, Dean of Libraries at Pepperdine, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's program. We are truly honored to have with us this afternoon an impressive group of scholars who have graciously offered to join us in conversation on the topic of today's gathering which is Dr. Ed Larson's recently published monograph entitled Franklin and Washington, The Founding Partnership. This important work is a thoroughly engaging expose that renowned historian Gordon Wood hails as indispensable in fully understanding the role that these two individuals had in shaping the American Revolution. Dr. Larson's thoughtful and extraordinarily well-documented dual biography of Franklin, the sage of Philadelphia, and Washington, the gentleman soldier, is in many ways a study in contrasts, joined together and told through the historic record that comes down to us through letters, journals, artistic renderings, and evidence of the sort found in libraries and archives. Thus, it's entirely fitting that we center today's discussion in the library, albeit the virtual one. Now, for those of you who may not be familiar with Dr. Larson's work, a brief introduction is in order. Dr. Larson holds the Darling Chair in Law and is University Professor of History at Pepperdine, recipient of the 1998 Pulitzer Prize in History, Larson served as associate counsel for the US House of Representatives and taught for 20 years at the University of Georgia where he chaired the history department. The author of 12 books and over 80 articles, his books include A Magnificent Catastrophe, The Tumultuous Election of 1800, Evolution, The Remarkable History of a Scientific Theory, the Pulitzer Prize winning Summer for the Gods, The Scopes Trial, and America's Continuing Debate Over Science and Religion, and the New York Times bestseller, The Return of George Washington, 1783 to 1789. Larson recently published the book to be discussed this afternoon, Franklin and Washington, the first book length study for the 30 year relationship between America's two leading founders. His article on science, history, and law have appeared in such varied journals as Nature, Time, Atlantic Monthly, American History, Scientific American, The Nation, Wall Street Journal, ISIS, and 20 different law journals, including Virginia Law Review and Constitutional Commentary. He's the co-author of seven books additionally, including the Essential Words and Writings of Clarence Darrow, and The Constitutional Convention, A Narrative History from the Notes of James Madison. Now our program this afternoon will take the form of a moderated panel discussion between two of Pepperdine's finest scholars, reflecting on Dr. Larson's work from the perspectives of their respective disciplines. Dr. Larson shall then comment on particular topics raised with time allowed for questions from the audience. I'd like to express our appreciation to Vice Provost Lee Katz for his support for today's program and, in, and express my gratitude to all those who helped promote today's event. Now we're honored indeed to have with us Mr. Anthony Panay to moderate this afternoon's conversation. Mr. Panay serves as Chief Learning Officer at the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute. He is the author of a short biography of Ronald Reagan and the forthcoming The Civic Mission of Museums. Mr. Panay, who holds degrees from Claremont McKenna College and the University of Hawaii, has served as Chair of the EDCOM Professional Network for the American Alliance of Museums won the Civic Action Award from the California Council for the Social Studies, and was appointed to the advisory board for the California K-12 Civic Learning Task Force. Our first panelist is Dr. Christopher Soper, 
who serves as Distinguished Professor of Political Science at Pepperdine. Dr. Soper received his PhD in Political Science from Yale University, his Master in Divinity in Theology from Yale University Divinity School, and his BA from the University of Washington. He is the author or co-author of eight books on various topics related to religion and politics, and of numerous essays and articles in scholarly journals. His most recent book, Religion and Nationalism in Global Perspective, was published in 2018 by Cambridge University Press. And was the, he was the recipient of the Distinguished Book Award for 2020 from the Society for the Scientific Study of Religion. Now he shall be followed by Dr. Michael Dittmore, who serves as professor of English at Pepperdine with a specialization in early American literature. His, public had, his published articles and chapters have focused on figures such as William Bradford, Anne Hutchison, Anne Bradstreet, and Benjamin Franklin. His present research project is focused on textual and literary approaches to America's founding documents, especially the Declaration of Independence. From all of us at Pepperdine, we extend a warm welcome to our panelists and look forward to your reflections on this very important work. With that, I will turn it over to Anthony to get us started. Gentlemen, the screen is yours. Excellent, thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, and so our panelists uh, are gonna start off by giving their initial reaction. So with this, I will turn it over to Chris first. Well, thank you. I want to thank the library for hosting this event and many others, uh, for Jeffrey for asking me to participate, and last but not least to Ed for writing such an interesting book. As Mark noted, I'm a political scientist by training, and I have to admit that whenever I have a notion to do some research and writing on the founders, I immediately think of the famous phrase that fools rush in where angels fear to tread. The field is fruitful to be sure, just ask Ron Chernow of Hamilton fame. But the research around the founding generation is well-traveled, some might say pulverized, with scores and scores of books. To his credit, Ed has managed to find a new path to the founders by looking at the friendship between Franklin and Washington, the work that they accomplished together, and what that friendship can tell us about the nation that they collectively helped to build. As Ed notes, Franklin and Washington had very different backgrounds and personalities. Washington was the classic patrician, while Franklin was the quintessential man of the people. Washington was aloof and reserved, Franklin gregarious and outgoing. Despite these differences, Ed shows that Franklin and Washington were united on most of the large political issues of the day. The need for independence from the British, their commitment to building a new sense of American identity in a politically fractured society, and a shared belief that in the new constitution that they helped to draft, the national government desperately needed expanded powers if America was to survive. And Ed convincingly makes the case that these two seminal figures worked together on these key issues and that their roles were indispensable for whatever success that followed. I highly recommend the book and hope that you all get a chance to read it. I wanna spend a few minutes teasing out a few questions or observations from the book that I hope that Ed might consider later. My first observation is about the Declaration of Independence. Ed describes Franklin as quote, a seasoned editor, but that might be downplaying the role that both he and Adams played in creating it. Part of the reason that history remembers Jefferson as the author is because Jefferson put on his tombstone, author, the Declaration of Independence. But maybe that was a self-aggrandizing gesture. Perhaps Jefferson was the scribe while Adams and, Fa and Franklin did the foundational intellectual work on the document. What we do know is that the Declaration fed straight into abolitionist movements and efforts. 
It was the basis of a text that was submitted in Massachusetts in, in January of 1777, moving forward toward abolition. The Declaration, far more than the Constitution, was at the heart of Frederick Douglass's narrative on the true meaning of America, and Lincoln quoted from it extensively throughout his presidency. I might add that this is hardly an academic debate, as our country and university are polarized on the question of how we remember the founding. When we focus on Jefferson, we get one part of America's story, the story of the slaveholding South. We don't get the part of the story which was about how abolitionism was developing already, even in the 18th century. So I think that Ed, while he does do a good job of talking about Franklin's role in abolition, may not give him quite enough credit for some of the intellectual work of the Declaration. My second observation is about Washington's political vision and what, if anything, it tells us about our current political environment. Our system of representative government was born from a fear of participation by the broad mass of the population, a large percentage of whom were poor and illiterate. Washington was a patrician who believed that political power should be exercised by a political elite whose social and economic position justified their leadership. So there's a bifurcation between the notion that rights pertain to everybody as articulated in the Declaration and the question of who should actually have access to political power and be able to control political institutions. As Ed notes in his discussion of Shea's rebellion, Washington, quote, it quoted liberty with the defense of property rights. And to a certain extent, that was true for various features of the Constitution, which are designed to protect the status quo against popular majorities. After all, Shea and his followers just wanted a looser monetary policy, debt relief, and more participatory democracy in economic policy. That Washington read the event as such a threat, however, suggests his aversion to popular democracy. As Madison put it in the Federalist Papers in words that would have won Washington's approval, the people cannot be trusted because they can err. Now, from our 21st century perspective, it's easy to say that Washington was simply wrong, as evidenced by the expansion of democracy throughout American history. Or maybe he was not so wrong after all. Among the most significant recent global political events has been the rise of populist movements in places as diverse as India and Turkey, Poland and Hungary, England, and yes, the United States. The slogan of all populist parties is the pure people against the corrupt elite or the will of the majority against rule by the minority. Maybe in this populist moment, Washington has something to teach us, yes, about the benefits of democracy, but also about its potential pitfalls. And then finally, uh, Ed makes, I think, a very persuasive case that Washington personified a particular notion of Republican virtues. Uh, and that's a set of political values that seems very foreign from a 21st century perspective. What the idea that uh, people, political leaders could uh, ignore their own personal self-interest for the larger interests of the public. So I'd be interested to have Ed talk a little bit more about what he sees as Republican virtues. Clearly, they were manifest in a person like Washington. And is it simply that that political tradition has disappeared in American politics? Or is there something about changes in American democracy since the founding that make Republicanism simply less relevant? So again, thank you, Ed, for your book, and I look forward to your comments. Excellent, thank you very much, Chris. Uh, and with that, we're gonna turn to Michael for his reaction. Thank you very much, Anthony. And I'd like to express my appreciation as well to the library, to Ed, this was a wonderful book to read. I'd like to begin by noting the subtitle, The Founding Partnership. And as uh, Ed adds later on, that launched a nation. Often when we think on the revolutionary generation, uh, I think we're drawn sometimes toward the younger elements. And so if we think of a partnership, it might be Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, especially working out the constitution, but well beyond that into the early 1800s. 
or even Jefferson and John Adams, despite the rupture in the middle of their lives, they did so much together and came back later in their life, continued that way. But not necessarily Benjamin Franklin and George Washington. Franklin passed away just as the government under the new constitution and under the leadership of Washington was being implemented and stress tested. But even Washington had passed away before the momentous game-changing election of 1800. They were in that way truly founders, laying a foundation for others to build on just as we continue to do. And I appreciate Chris's questions, the ways in which that still happens or doesn't happen, we need to think about. But given their differences and talents, they also might have been more of a revolutionary odd couple, a kind of 18th century Oscar and Felix, for those who remember the Neil Simon uh, old play, right? Franklin could be fairly characterized as an adept writer, a mechanic of sorts, and cosmopolitan all before he was 20. It would be hard to apply the term cosmopolitan to Washington, I think, although he certainly uh, and repeatedly had engaged the world that he surveyed and explored and attacked and defended thoroughly. Franklin wound up spending a considerable portion of his life overseas on various political and diplomatic missions in England and France for years at a time, while Washington never crossed the Atlantic, but instead traveled widely in North America and often under harrowing and adverse conditions. Franklin was a unique and world-class scientist. Any number of his discoveries still resonate in our lives, but just think of electricity alone, where would we be right now? Washington was the solid and grave military leader who exercised an extraordinary self-control and foresight that he resigned his military commission at the termination of the war when he might have had a great temptation to continue that leadership. Franklin was a prodigious reader and writer from his teenage years in Boston, a wit and satirist whose talents would sustain him all the way to his deathbed, where he still worked away at his autobiography. But Washington was the proverbial person of few words, but whose few words conveyed great power and significance. And those are just a few high points. Ed's book richly deepens these contrasts to help us see more powerfully the concerns and motivations and the just larger than life extraordinariness that enabled them to work together, even when far apart in distance or time, toward a common good and a common goal. One has to think of their divergent origins, Franklin from a large artisan family in Boston who had run away under somewhat shady circumstances to Philadelphia by age 17, and Washington born to the Virginia plantation gentry in which he prospered and in which he died. What they both saw early on and what they drew on from their experiences in the 1750s during the French and Indian War was both the futility of depending on British competence on the one hand, and on the other, the vital importance of communicating and uniting across colonial boundaries. That would require the difficult compromising work of both expelling the British when the time came, but also finding commonalities across sometimes distinct and difficult state bridges once independence came. The catastrophe of Braddock's defeat was enough to convince them, I think, of this importance. Although their paths often took very literal different directions, this common determination provided a very workable and respectful relationship across 30 plus years. For instance, Franklin was abroad trying diplomatically to sort through Pennsylvania's complicated affairs with the Penn family. Or then you have Washington and troops working through truly miserable winters early in the war while Franklin worked to forge a necessary alliance with the French. But extraordinary as they were, they also were both practical to the core, as Larson calls them, enlightenment pragmatist at heart. It's a great phrase. But there was a price to pay one which ultimately proved a final dividing point perhaps. If in the constitution they managed to cross various conflicts to create not only a stronger national government, one better equipped to deal with debts and repayments, but also one with a strong executive, one designed for a leader like Washington, it also came at the cost of perpetuating slavery at a time when Franklin himself was adopting a stronger abolitionist stance and refused to be silent on the matter. While Washington himself, unwilling to deal directly with the issue, maintained his own silence, and maybe somewhat longer than he needed to, even in his will. Perhaps in his remarks, Ed might share with more, us more of his thoughts on this final episode and a truly remarkable partnership that remains vital and informative in 2020, as we are on the cusp of yet another national election. Thank you.
Excellent. Well, I want to thank you both. We have a we have a period of discussion now for a little bit before we hear from um, Ed is going to give his reaction here in, in, in about 20 minutes. Um, so I just wanted to pick up on a, a couple of the common themes uh, that I heard from both of you and, and, and dig into those a little bit deeper. One of those, um, obviously, the, the book is about founding partnerships. So the theme of partnership um, throughout and um, Michael, as you mentioned, that it really is kind of an odd couple, right? And we look at the political, um, the political things that are happening during the Constitutional Convention, there's a lot of balancing going on. And in many ways, Franklin and Washington represent a lot of those tensions that take place in the Constitutional Convention, right? On one hand, we have, we have the North and the South. Uh, we have the, the city and the kind of agrarian agriculture of the, of the, um, of the South. We have, um, you know, Ben Franklin, who kind of up by the bootstraps versus Washington, who was born into wealth. Uh, so we have these kind of contradictions and these inherent conflicts that are happening in the Constitution, in some ways embodied by America's two greatest, arguably two greatest figures at the time. Uh, and so I'd like to, to dive a little bit more into that. So what was it that you think or that you read or that you might question that caused these two gentlemen to have such a powerful uh, partnership at the beginning of the, the outset of the country? A little unclear. Is that to me or to? Oh, that's to, to Michael and Chris at first. Oh, good. That's what I thought. Yeah, yeah I think part of it, and I, I did probably shift this over to Ed, who could do it much better than I could. I think part of it had to do with Braddock's defeat, that the, both the ways that they saw that uh, transpire. And I think as I'm getting it out of Ed's book, and I love hearing Ed talk more about it, but seeing British incompetence at play, but also this idea that somehow they're going to have to find ways to correspond and communicate across these boundaries that are not just physical boundaries, other kind of things as well. You have a situation in which you have really kind of like 13 colonies with differing, different kind of relationships back to England. And I think Franklin and Washington both understood really well from that experience, the only way they were gonna go forward was to find commonality across the boundaries they already had. Yeah, and I would just reiterate that um... As I said, I think they agreed on the big political issues of the day. Um, and as Ed points out, they were pragmatic. So their points of disagreement, and I, again, I too am interested to have Ed talk more about slavery. I think it was the most decisive disagreement they had. But even other disagreements they had, they were schooled in political compromise and pragmatism and it, to, to reach a larger goal. And the larger goals they, they generally agreed on, whether it was why they needed independence, why they needed a new constitution, why they needed a stronger central government. Yeah. And I, I, to, to follow up a little bit on that, so the, the, the idea of the founding partnership and the idea of kind of pragmatic politicians who maybe necessarily aren't getting everything that they want, but they're compromising for this greater good that you've both mentioned. Uh, as you, as you noted Michael, you know, Franklin passed away before, you know, the, the country took off and, and Washington before 1800. So it's been 220 years since either of them has been playing an active role in, in how we've, um, you know, the, how our democracy, our republic has played out, yet still they seem resonant. And that's, you know, one of the things as I was, I was reading, it was how remarkably resonant the stories of, of their lives and, and their work still felt in 2020. Um, and I was wondering if you if you had any thoughts on that. Why is it that you think you know these these uh, these men long long past still have kind of a resonance in in America today? Well, I I'll go out. I'll shoot for what uh, Franklin still makes us laugh. I mean, just to be honest about it, there were things in the autobiography that still when I read it with students. They still find incredibly witty and amusing, and not just the autobiography, but other things as well. But there's sometimes a bite with that as well. And I think students really love, well, and I do too, <laughs> after all these years, I keep rereading those passages over and over again. Uh, Washington probably is a, one that's harder for me to kind of resonate with. I, Chris, what about you? Well, I'm gonna uh, further complicate your question, Anthony, because at several points in the book, Ed takes I think appropriate pot shots at what we call originalism. So one answer to your question would be, well, they resonate because we should all be originalists. They were originals. So their understanding of what was going on should shape our understanding. But Ed rejects that theory. 
So your, your question is even more complicated because the simple answer would be they were founders, their perception of what they were doing in the constitution should guide our deliberations now. I think Ed rejects that. Um, I, I'm with Michael, Washington seems very foreign and it's also hard, you know, I, I was convinced in reading the book that he genuinely embraced these Republican virtues I was talking about mm -hmm. earlier. So, you know, I don't think it's just hagiography around him. I think he, he genuinely did do that. So maybe part of the answer is that we are in an age that desperately yearns for something like that and we don't see it. Um, and again, I think it's a complicated question about why we don't see it, but it, it could be part of what resonates is that we see what they did was to forego their self-interest for some larger good. I mean, not the least of which they, you know, Franklin literally is working on his deathbed on political issues. So part of it just may be what, you know, the life that they gave to the country. Um, and, and consistently throughout their whole lives. Now, and, and both of you mentioned the, the question of slavery. And I think it, you know, in the book, Ed does a, a great job of talking about, um, you know, obviously very, very contentious, both in the, you know, the very first days of, of Congress and in the Constitutional Convention. And, and certainly that's something we see playing out in the present, right? Uh, in the debate about, you know, what do we study and what do we value in American history? The, you know, the New York Times 1619 project, of, of course, comes to mind. Um, so my, my question to you, um, and, uh, it, you know, it, Washington largely punted, right? Franklin largely punted the, down the road. We see that in the Constitution, both in the, in the text, where it's like, okay, we'll pick this up and deal with it in 1808. Um, uh, but also, you know, even, even in his kind of final statement where Washington and his will, um, you know, he, he frees his slaves. Um, but you see that even, even that gesture is kind of left. Both sides aren't quite sure how to deal with it when they see that play out. Um, do you think you know, as, as we look backwards, and it, it's, it's a very difficult thing to do to, to read history through the context of the present, right? Because the context they were in was a much different time. But had they taken up and dealt with that issue in, in, a, in a meaningful way during either the Constitutional Convention uh, or, you know, in the first Congress or something like that, um, do you think that the America that we live in is similar or even exists? Interesting question in this way, and I think Ed makes this point, I'd love for him to expand on it later, that uh, that seems like it, it could have worked until about the, around 1805. Right in there, there gets to be a point at which not being able to deal with slavery early on is going to lead to a civil war uh, just down the road. There's just no way to avoid it by that point. I think one of the interesting things maybe to look at it, uh, maybe it's something in a different kind of way for a moment, going back to something Chris had said earlier, so I, I'm, not, I'm never quite sure exactly where Franklin is with the drafting of the Declaration. Uh, he's certainly mentioned by Jefferson in certain ways, but it's an interesting question. But Franklin certainly knew, for example, the slavery clause that Jefferson originally wrote for the Declaration that was taken out. And it was taken out completely. And so neither Jefferson, neither, neither Adams nor Franklin could think of a way to retain that, even though Adams expressed admiration for it. But of course, Washington wasn't there at all to see any of that. So later when they come to the Constitutional Convention and they deal with slavery, you have an interesting kind of place maybe to think about a possible difference between the two of them. Franklin comes to that with this other, earlier kind of experience, having seen South Carolina and Georgia threaten to walk if that clause is included in the Declaration, and then later threatening to walk again if they deal with slavery in some other kind of way at that point. And yet it seems to me from, from Ed's book that Franklin nonetheless believed that there was a kind of uh, foothold to be made with the Constitution. Slavery wasn't gonna be eradicated at that moment, but the way the Constitution's put together would lay the groundwork for that occurring down the way. I, Chris, I don't know if that's kind of fits with how you'd see it or not. Yeah, I think uh, Ed's reading, I think is that Franklin was naively hopeful that it would go away through the Constitutional powers and that he was wrong about that. So let's just be clear. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think Ed tells a convincing story that a number of del state Southern delegates threatened to walk. Now, 
you know, it's easy for the 21st century perspectives, but I sometimes wonder when I look at Congress now, there are all sorts of threats about walking from deals. And part of that is just politicking. So it either, either the Northern delegates didn't care enough about the issue to push it, A, B, they really did believe Southern delegates were gonna walk, or C, they just didn't play hardball enough in way that Southern delegates did. Um, because there are so many pro-slavery provisions in the constitution. So maybe they played a bad hand. I mean, they may have had a better hand to play. Um, it's hard for me to imagine we would not be one country right now, just given the geographic realities. I mean, look what happened to American territorial expansion. It was sort of inevitable. Didn't matter if it was Spanish, French, Mexican, Native American, it was going to happen. So I suspect we would be now one United States of America. It would have been a very different history. So I'm, again, I'm curious to hear Ed because in some ways Washington's position is consistent with his racist views. And, and the, the one you really have to explain more is Franklin. Um, because Washington was just doing the bidding of Southern slaveholding delegates whose views he shared. But what about Franklin? Why, why didn't he and, and others from the North uh, push it more consistently? Yeah, and if I add one thing to that really quickly that I, I find a little bit baffling in this way, Franklin, throughout all of his life, I mean, really, if we go back when he's 15, <laughs> roughly, and going forward, is always inventive and always looking for ways to improve, always looking for inventions and discoveries. When he comes to oppose slavery, I don't know that he presents slave owners with a way out, other than to say, you know, it needs to be emancipation right now. And maybe Ed can give us a better insight on that. I'm just not real clear on that point. This seems to be the one place to me where Franklin has this opportunity to give us some kind of plan, something that will appeal pragmatically to the slaveholder to do something about this. And I'm not sure I'm seeing that, but maybe, maybe I'm just missing that. So we'll come back. All right, we have enough time for maybe another a question or two before we turn it over to, to Ed to uh, have a response. But I want to, for our uh, viewers who are watching in the audience, the last 10 minutes or so will be kind of an open Q&A. So if you have any questions that pop into your mind as you're listening, or if you've read the book and have some questions uh, for Ed, please feel free to just go ahead and put those in the chat. So my, my next question is about the lessons of leadership. So it's about the founding partnership. So the, the title is interesting in a time where political partnership uh, is certainly not something we see much of, especially across party lines, right? Um, you know, you have the, the example of Franklin and Washington. So one, that the idea that they're partners and two, the, the idea that the type of political leaders that they are is quiet. You know, Washington famously sits at the entire convention and says almost nothing. Um, Franklin is working behind the scenes, right? So you have these quiet consensus seekers who are deemed, you know, in, in many ways, two of the biggest leaders of this period of history. This is a type of leadership that I think the modern person who, who looks and thinks about political leadership might say, oh my gosh, there's no way that, that these two gentlemen would be considered leaders in the traditional sense or how the definition of leadership has evolved. Uh, so I'd, I'd love to hear your comments or your thoughts on, on what um, Ed might be saying about leadership as a whole uh, in, in this work. Chris. Well, in some ways, your question goes back to some of my comments about populism, which is really just the expansion of participatory democracy. I mean, at one level, they had the advantage that they didn't have to appeal to a broad mass of the people. So maybe in an environment like that, it was easier to be the silent, sturdy military leader who has very little to say because nobody expects you or wants you to be charismatic. So part of it may not be that we just don't create leaders like that anymore. Part of it may be it's hard in this environment where winning political office takes a different set of skills. Uh, now, it may be that the skills it takes to win political office have nothing to do with the skills of actually operating in that office. Uh, 
And, and that is unfortunate for us. We, we are lucky if we get a leader who both can be, to win a popular election and have leadership skills. But in Washington's day, you know, at least through what, Jackson's presidency, they didn't have to worry about that. I, you know, I think one curious element of it is uh, Franklin, as Ed points out, and this is you know, a, a thing that people oftentimes say about Franklin, he was a person of many masks. He took on many kinds of roles. And the interesting thing about that, he's nonetheless built a sense of trust with some people at least, even though they couldn't always figure out where he actually landed uh, with different kinds of things. I find that fascinating. And yet Ed also points out that uh, Washington himself, going back to Chris's point about Republican virtue, also had this kind of stoic image he would keep on the outside. You never were quite sure what was in the inside, but nonetheless, he could, have, he could show great leadership skills by doing that in a different kind of way. For Franklin, part of the issue is he recognized early in his life that if you ever want to put a project forward in the public, never put your name on it. People will never trust you if you do that. So you always have to look like you're working behind the scenes. So oftentimes when he was publishing pamphlets early on, say to print currency in Philadelphia or whatever it would be, he would publish them anonymously. Everybody I'm sure knew who it was, but he made sure his name wasn't on that. And I think that's a, a big part of their partnership in a different kind of way. So when you think about the Constitutional Convention, you have Washington in that chair every day, right? And he may not say a lot and everybody knows when they're describing the executive, they're talking about Washington. But Franklin's going to be that person in different kinds of ways, working behind the scenes, making connections with people, and, and really kind of talking through things, I think. And that's part of what made their, their partnership so valuable. Maybe that's a different kind of way of thinking about leadership for us as well. Excellent. All right. Well, we have been talking about his work for quite a while, and I think it's uh, it's about time. I know you have a lot of questions that you have posed to Ed and, and some things I'd like to hear and some responses. Before we get to Ed, though, um, the, the library has generously agreed to give away two copies of, of Ed's book, Franklin and Washington, The Founding Partnership. If you are interested in uh, being considered for that, uh, I believe they're going to put a, a form in the chat. So please fill that out and you'll be eligible to win a copy of the book. Um, so with that, uh, we're now going to turn it over uh, to our author, Ed, go ahead. Well, thank you. You've given me so much to think about, both Michael and Chris. I appreciate so much the different viewpoints you have brought to what I wrote. As you know, what an author throws something out, but he never quite knows how it's received. Um, and what it inspires. And to me, hearing two people that I so respect talk about things and raise points, um, it means a lot to me. And I think you all made good criticisms. You were very generous and uh, sort of softened the blow, but good criticisms, good observations, and good questions. And I can't even begin to start on them. Uh, let me talk about, you mentioned type of partnership, and you talked about well, it's not the ones we think about, like Madison and Jefferson or Washington and Hamilton, and that's true. It's true, but it is, it is a type of partnership that does exist. Think of people with, instead, of, we think of hierarchical partnerships, um, Lincoln and his team of rivals, or, or Jefferson and Madison, or Washington and Hamilton. But now think of a different type. Think of World War II and think of Churchill and Roosevelt. They were both indispensable. They, all, they both had their own standing. They brought, both brought their own interest in uh, to play. But it was the partnership that was essential. Nobody, that's it. They needed the two of them to beat Hitler. They couldn't have done it alone. Um, or for the civil rights movement in America, you needed both Martin Luther King and Lyndon Johnson. They needed each other. They wouldn't have passed the Civil Rights Act or the or the Voting Rights Act without both of them. And yet they were both, you know, they were both sort of co-equal in there. They brought different things to play in different parts. And so I sort of came to view Washington. What surprised me about this story was what good friends they were. Um, I thought I knew they worked together. They had to work together because we wouldn't, every historian agrees that we wouldn't have won the revolution without both of them. They were the two indispensable parties. Oh, sure, Adams and Jefferson and the others mattered, uh, Nathaniel Green. But without the two of them, each of them separately doing what they did, it would have failed. Washington in the field and his dignity, 
Franklin and his diplomacy. We wouldn't have won without France um, and their vision. So it was a di it was a different sort of partnership, uh, a partnership of equals in a way. Um, that was captured when they both went to the Second Continental Congress, which led to the Declaration of Independence and Washington to be appointed head of the troops. They were the two heroes. I mean, nobody else was greeted like them. The whole the bells rang in every church when Washington came in. He was out and greeted for the Second Continental Congress and brought in with a military escort. Jeff, uh, Franklin dramatically came in from the ocean and everyone came out to the coast to greet him. Nobody else was greeted like that, not, ha not Hancock, not any of the others. And the same thing happened for the Constitutional Convention. Now, Franklin was already there, but they were the two heroes. They were the two people lionized. Nobody was like them. And the fact that they could get along, they were both, they were both self-effacing in their own way, in the sense that they were both comfortable in their own skin. They bo both knew their status and they didn't need anybody, anybody to, you know, to glorify them, to they didn't, they they could share, as Michael points out. Franklin loved to give all his best ideas to somebody else to put forth um, because he didn't need it. Washington was like that too. He always, before every battle, um, he always called together all of his um, lieutenants and listened to them all before coming up with the conclusion. Well, that's not how most generals work. That's not how Grant worked. Um, that's not how Horatio Gates worked. Um, that's not how Napoleon worked. It was a different. It was a different sort of leadership. They both. They both were compromisers, and that when you talk about when you talk about their weaknesses, you talk about your questions and not doing what they might have accomplished. It ties in that they both were by nature. They wouldn't compromise on the big things, what they viewed as the biggest things, but they compromise on means to get their ends, and um, they instinctively did it. So um, that led to some of the issues that come up. Could slavery have been different? Perhaps there were people back then, and I go back to that time, there are people back then, like Hamilton, like Lawrence, uh, like La Lafayette, I mean, not insignificant people who thought that the revolutionary era offered the one opportunity to, for, what, for America to take another route. And it was already gone by the invention of the cotton gin. It was already gone by 1800. Washington freeing his slaves was too late. Um, if Washington had acted sooner, well, like the Franklin Act, but then Franklin, of course, you know, what I've often wondered is, but Franklin was governor of Pennsylvania. President was his official title elected unit, he came back to an, from serving as um, ambassador to France. And Pennsylvania was riven apart by two organized political parties that were at each other's neck. And the, the government was not working. And Franklin comes in and they both talk to him, be our leader. And he becomes governor, president of Connecticut. When a president had a lot, when a governor had a lot more power because there was no central government, and it worked, it worked. The state became one of the few success stories during that period where its economy flourished, its business flourished. It opened the frontier. Both he was elected the first time he had one vote against him. The next two times he was elected unanimously in this divided state. Now they had a certain sort of represent, almost like an electoral college system, but it was unanimous. Just like Washington, when the Federalists and Anti-Federalists divided the country, he was the only president who was elected unanimously twice. Now that speaks to certain skills of bridging differences and working behind. Now, at the same time that he was governor of Pennsylvania, he assumes leadership, presidency of the Pennsylvania Abolition Society, the first American society committed to abolishing slavery, logically coming from Quaker Pennsylvania. He had already had a reputation. For 40 years, he had published abolitionist literature. He had been the first person. He had a picture of Benjamin Lay in his house 
that his wife put up. He had funded schools for free blacks and for slave blacks and sent his own black slaves when he had them to the school for an education. He had then made alliances nation, internationally with people like Erasmus Darwin and the abolitionist leaders in Europe. So he goes to the Constitutional Convention as president of the Philadelphia Abolitionist Society. And they ask him, we know this, move for freedom, move for abolitionists at the Constitutional Convention. And he apparently discusses this with Washington. Because when Washington comes to the Constitutional Convention, the first place he goes is to Franklin's home. He goes to Franklin home to meet with Franklin to say, what can we do to make this convention work? And it's almost certain that the issue of slavery came up. And um, Washington was the compromiser. He was the representative of the South. He did. Everything Chris said was true. And Franklin must have made a pledge that, OK, I won't raise it at the convention. Because like you, the two of us have to stand together or this is going to fail. But he gave his statements to Governor Morris. And at the convention, he sat next to Governor Morris and Wilson, John Wilson. And they made powerful statements against slavery at the Constitutional Convention. But it wasn't Franklin. Franklin was sitting next to them, feeding them lines. And then what he does is as soon as the government forms, the first thing he does is send abolitionist petitions to the government that, that drive Washington crazy because he says it's too early. We can't do this already. We know his private letters um, uh, about Franklin moving for slavery, but Franklin thought it had to be dealt with. Maybe he still waited too long. Maybe he bit his tongue too much. He thought though, and he said that once we get Georgia and South Carolina in this government, we can force them to, um, we will have the power to bring abolitionists. Didn't work out that way. He was gone. Madison played the game in Congress and the whole issue got set aside to 1808. Now, though, so maybe they didn't play their cards right. Maybe Franklin had lost a step by then, but he didn't offer, and I love that comment somebody brought, he never offered, a, he usually could think of some scheme that could make an impossible situation possible. And he never offered that scheme on slavery. Um, instead, he was became like a bull in a china shop. So yeah, Washington, of course, never did either. But of course, Washington was just as, um, as Chris presents him. Now, the one other thing, another thing that divided him at the convention, and this is interesting about leadership, there were four members of the Constitutional, there were three major compromises at the convention, the slavery compromises, the Senate, um, two votes for every state uh, compromise, and the presidency, the powers of the presidency, because the, the Virginia plan called for a president elected by Congress. So it'd be a system like England now has, or Germany, or, or Japan, you know, where the president is, is you know, uh, elected by Congress. That's what the Virginia plan had. Um, the rub with that that Madison would raise was we don't have separation of powers and we need separation of powers or we'll get too powerful. Um, Franklin's solution was a direct election for president and he pushed hard for it. He was part of the Virginia compromise. He was at the meetings where they drafted the Virginia plan, but then he joining with Governor Morris and joining with Wilson and joining with Hamilton and joining with the entire Massachusetts delegation said, we elect governors, why don't we elect a president? Washington squashed that because he knew the problem is if you had a direct election for president, which was, which was what Franklin wanted, was every person who voted got a vote. And in the South, half the people were slaves and they weren't gonna get to vote or free blacks couldn't vote in the South. And so they'd be overwhelmed with Northern votes where they even let free black votes in some Northern states like Pennsylvania and in New Jersey, scandalously, they even let women vote. Think of the number of votes that would be coming out of the North. And so they came up with this Rube Goldberg compromise of, of, the, of the Electoral College, which classically was offered by Governor Morris, the big proponent of direct election for president as sort of a solution to let the states decide it themselves and give everybody the votes 
based on the number of their people with some discount for the number of slaves, but no discount for the number of free blacks, even though they couldn't vote. Now, Washington, Franklin, you know, he never bought that. He just thought they gave too many powers to the presidency. And he, there were three, four people. Um, um, uh, the governor Randolph of Virginia balked. Um, he had offered the Virginia plan. James Mason, um, excuse me, George Mason, Washington's neighbor balked. And Elderberg Jerry of Massachusetts, usually famous for the, he became vice president later, but also famous for a gerrymandering. They, with Franklin, all use the same phrase. They said, what you've created here in this compromise is a fetus for monarchy. All four of them use that phrase. And three of them voted against the Constitution. The only one who broke and still voted for the, comp of the Constitution was Franklin, even though he had agreed, fetus of monarchy. And what he said was, in his closing speeches, despite this, and what he was talking about was the overpowerful presidency, I'm going to go ahead and vote for this because we're going to be led initially by a man with Republican virtue that we can trust, looking right at Washington. After that, this thing is going to lead to tyranny when the people can't expect anymore. That's why he famously said, we got a republic if you can keep it. At the convention, he actually said, this will lead to a presidential tyranny. He, was, he, 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 he thought so, but he thought, well, it, with Washington, we might get through a time. And then he becomes a big advocate of Washington being president. Um, so Franklin made his compromises, but I think what you said is, he had, and I think he saw what it could lead to, but he had that hope that somehow, and maybe it's an enlightenment hope that comes from rational pragmatism and a belief in reason that somehow, and a belief in divine providence, he didn't believe that Washington, that America won its victory because of the, divine, he wasn't a normal, he wasn't a, 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 a Christian, neither was Jack, neither was Washington, neither of them believed in, in Christ as the son of God, but they both believed in this sense of divine providence and maybe somehow this will work out. And um, that sort of brings a way they work together. Um, believing because they did agree that the future was in the West and we needed a government strong enough to open the West to settlement. They, they believed that was liberty. They believed in individual liberty and that came through opening more land for people and not getting people confined. They believed in a national market economy um, and they believed we were all Americans and they held those things in common. It bridged a lot of differences though. Um, and they really were in some ways, of course, it was later Jefferson and, and Madison that formed the so-called Democratic Republican Party, but they were really building on Franklin's newspaper, the Aurora, the work of Franklin's grandchildren, and really looking toward Franklin as the founder of that half of, of, a, of an anti, of, of modified, of constitutional anti-federalist. Um, and, uh, uh, and then Hamilton breaks off on the other end. So in that way, they're, they're in a foundation. And you made so many points. I don't know how many I lost and how many I missed, but they did have, they both managed somehow to have this broad appeal that, um, that was, when you look at the, 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 the limited appeal of Ham at the time, the divisiveness of a Hamilton, of an Adams, of a, of a John Jay, of a Pinckney, you look at how, of a Patrick Henry, you look how those people divided the country. And somehow Franklin sort of, and Washington sort of dodged off it and they, Franklin had his admirers in the South, heck they tried to name Tennessee the state of Franklin and Washington had his admirers in the North. Um, it, was a, it was a remarkable achievement. Um, and I, and and how they kept this Republican virtue alive because um, it was partly that they wouldn't, that they didn't covet power. And everybody thought they'd rather both, about both men is they'd rather step down. Franklin wonderfully said it the Constant, during the Constitution, but imagine anybody saying this today. He said, you know, I don't see what all the problem is. In a Republic, unlike a monarchy, the leaders are the servants of all 
And therefore, it's a promotion to step down because now you've become one of the leaders. Do, does any of our leaders think that way now? I think Franklin really thought that way. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Ed, for that for that thoughtful response. I think you've covered uh, many, many of the points and questions that were brought up by, by your colleagues. Uh, we have about four minutes left, and we have a question that came in from the audience uh, that uh, from uh, Dan Caldwell. So I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on this one. But what other partnership in American political history was most similar to that of Franklin and Washington? Well, I've already given my answer of what of 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 J of LBJ and Martin Luther King on civil rights. Um, there could well be many others, and Chris probably is the best to start ticking them off. Chris, any thoughts there? Uh, it's a good question. Uh, Ed, Ed came up with a good answer. Um, I mean, part of it, of course, is that you would want to point to a relationship like that at a seminal moment in American political history. So there might have been some, you know, in the 1880s or something, but it just doesn't matter as much as at the founding period or with civil rights. So I'm, I'm not coming up with any better one than Ed did, that's for sure. Maybe Webster and Clay in the compromises of 1850 and 18 uh, and Missouri Compromise. Yeah, although, that, I mean, that's sort of a, in, in its own way, it's a problematic it, it fits your categorization, but it's not as ennobling, let's say, as the other examples you gave. I mean, even the name of it, the Compromise of 1850 is a way of maintaining the status quo on slavery. So maybe it fits the category, but it's a problematic uh, example. Excellent. Well, we have a, we just have about a minute left. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll throw it to each of our panelists and then to Ed for a, for a final word or any closing thoughts you may have. So maybe I'll go to Michael first. Uh, kudos. I love this. This was great in every kind of way. And I really, I, and I appreciate your response, Ed, because I've learned an enormous amount of that in addition to the book. So many, many thanks to you. And I'll just echo that and say that I learned a lot from it. And I really do see lots of echoes with 2020. So don't think you're just reading about the founding. There's a lot of resonance with what we're experiencing right now. I thank you both for that. I do think there's resonance for today. I think Franklin and Washington are still important. Um, and um, that's one of the things that's important about history. That's important about literature, as, as Michael knows. That's important about political science. Um, we can learn from our past. We can, and it's good in doing so to not hold these people up just as monuments. Um, that's one of the things that I, this anti-monument movement is sort of interesting. It's very, very hard to put anybody on a monument because, there, it's so much better to what a library does or a museum like your museum, Anthony, or Mount Vernon, where you can contextualize these people. And when you contextualize them, they become relevant again. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, uh, Ed, Michael, Chris, uh, Pepperdine Libraries. If you don't have a copy of Ed's book, I've got a copy here. I encourage you to go out and get a copy as soon as you possibly can. It's a wonderful read, a uh, great gift with the holiday season coming up. Uh, there we go. Uh, you, can, you can get them. They, it's amazing. They ship it right to your door these days. So it's, uh, it's amazing how easy it is to get it. Uh, so thank you once again, Pepperdine. Thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of this conversation. I enjoyed it tremendously. I consider it a, a tremendous honor. So thank you very much and have a great day. And thank you to our audience for tuning in.